Good afternoon. Welcome. Hello. We really appreciate you all joining us. I know it's a difficult time for a lot of you, but I have some good news. You now are in the privacy of Steve Reynolds' office, and you don't even have to wear pants. You <laughs> have to wear pants, and we can see I have to wear you pants. Yes. You guys can be in your pajamas. You know, I hope that you're nice and relaxed and you don't have to worry about a thing. I mean, typically we'd ask you not to wear perfume. Now you can. You can pretty much do whatever you want. A friend of mine sent me a really funny little tidbit. She said, she saw a post that said, I'm either going to come out of this quarantine totally balanced with my chakras aligned and great attitude and I've lost some weight or I'll be an absolute overweight raving bitch. Oh. Do you guys have choices? <laughs> you can, we're here for you, in other words. So we'll help you be your best self. That's the purpose of this. I am here with three pretty great individuals. Um, it's Steve Reynolds, of course, and we'll get into his background in a minute. Hi, Steve. Hey there. Paul Salcedo. Hello. And we have a fabulous moderator, so you guys need to contact him <clears throat> with all your burning questions, the hospitality manager, James Lovitz. So he's watching. Make sure that he has something to do, so ask lots. So I will start with Paul because he's a facilitator and a host for the most. He's got a fantastic company called Bottled In. Tell us about it. Hi, right, thanks, Alona. So um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about Bottled In. Um, we... Steve, you know, we, we connect producers like Steve uh, to essentially use their, their, uh, their products, like their bot to make the bottle smart, as well as um, a bunch of different avenues. And um, it's essentially what we've done with Steve is uh, he has his, um, all his bottles of wine that we've uh, put NFC chips on which is a smart label. And essentially you can take our bottle of an app and scan any one of his wines. Uh, I believe we were at eight, about over 80,000 bottles of Steve's right now that actually have the technology. Um, we're also doing a bunch of just smart technology. Uh, we generate cue cards, all these type of things, but we built a platform essentially to help producers like Steve and, and the wine industry as well as spirits and alcohol to engage with their customers using um, smart technology. It's long story short, as a platform. Um, you can get the app, it's free, it's on the Google Store and it's on the Apple Store. Um, and then um, Steve was actually one of the first to market to actually do this. He did this in 2018. Um, if you, being a tech geek I am, if you take a look at um, what's going on in technology right now, it's, uh, there's a lot of smart products coming out and this is what we are doing. We're making smart bottles of wine that can engage with, with Steve's customers. Um, the one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is, you know, what, what we're all going through right now. And, um, I, I, I got this, I got Ilona, I got Steve, I got James all together to kind of bring this Facebook live. Uh, we, I, I wanted to do something the last couple of weeks and I wasn't sure we've got this incredible technology that lets you communicate through digital, pretty much it's a digital marketing platform. And, um, I just was like, with everyone sheltered in place, where does, where do we do, what do we do with this? And so the last week I've been coming up with the idea and, um, this is what it is. You guys are watching it. It's a little different than I think most people have. You'll see over in the, the corner, a little fire flame because it's Steve's fireside wine chat, right? Uh, you'll see, um, you'll see the labels. You'll see a nice slideshow on the, on the bottom corner of all, all these pictures that Steve gave me. You're, most people aren't going to get these great pictures. Um, on the bottom part, you'll see, you guys, it's the deals that you can get. They made a great deal today on the wine. It's $141 for all four wines that he's going to show, plus a 20 shipping. Look at the promo code. It says ship. Um, websites in the middle of the panel. On the right side, if you're just lazy, you can do the QR code. And I'm going to actually show you how to do that right now. Um, but I um, I just wanted to say that to continue on, on the shelter in place and COVID-19 and everything that's going on right now, um, I just want to give back. Uh, so Steve is my first, I've taught, reached out to our other wineries. I am actually looking to you know, anyone else that wants to do this. We're actually going to do it for free. I, you know, while we all have to be sheltered, I want to be able to communicate. And this, I think is going to be a really fun Avenue. Um, and I think we can do more of these with other, other people. And you'll probably see more from Steve as well. And we'll probably do some on YouTube and maybe Twitter down the road. But right now we did, we chose Facebook. 
Um, so with that said, I'm going to go through a real quick one for you guys. I'm going to show you um, kind of the cool dynamics of this. Uh, if you guys take a look at the screen, you'll see a it actually covered up Steve. But um, let me see if I I'm going to cover up my face. Um, and you take a look at that the the phone right there. If you launch your camera on your iPhone or your Android it will detect these QR codes. So if you click the bottom one right there, you'll see it launches Safari. And what that does, it goes straight to the Reynolds website. And if you take a look, they've got that deal right there for you. So go, you know, just take your phone, take the camera, scan that QR code, and you can now just get the, the, the package that's there. You don't have to look for it. It's just that simple. The other side of it that we have is if you go back to your camera, um, or if you go get the bottle of an app, I'm gonna show you right there. If you get the bottle of an app, there's this green button here in the middle or logo. If you click that, you'll see it brings up this screen and you can hit a, on the left, it's called an NFC tag. The middle is called a QR code and the, the right, it's a label scan. So what, you know, again, my technology is smart. It's, uh, and what I wanted to show you is in this here, we're gonna click that middle button, which is a QR code scanner. And, oh, that's sorry, that's not the one that I wanted to show. I scanned the wrong QR code. This is the QR code right here I wanna show. And you'll see it says Vintag found. And what you see, it went straight to Steve's tastings. And when you go into the tastings, you'll see he has a classic tasting and a reserve experience tasting. Those are actually, if you go into his, uh, his uh, winery and do a tasting, you can actually follow along. You can actually see all the wines that he actually has pouring. So the classic tasting, got the Sauvignon Blanc, the Pinot Noir, and so on and so forth. Um, for this chat we're doing, we, I, have, I made a special one. It's called FB Live Side Wine Chat. And so if you take a look at that, um, it's got the, the Chardonnay, it's got the Persistence, it's got the Ember, and it's got the Steward of the Land, which are the wines we're going to talk about today. So I wanted to kind of show that to you. I'm going to cut out after this, um, but I did you know, want to thank everyone. And again, I, I, I'm doing this because I, I just think it's going to be fun. We're all at home. Steve's going to start drinking some tequila, so we're all going to have fun here. So I'm going to minimize the window, go back to the screen here, and then take it back to Lona. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for everything that you do. I think it's so important right now that folks like yourself are stepping up and generously donating their time and goodwill. We're so interconnected. We just didn't know it. And now it's in our face. And those of us that reach out um, and extend themselves, I think, are the true heroes of this really difficult moment. Um, speaking of true heroes, um, I as I introduce myself, I'm Ilona Thompson. I have a platform called Palette Exposure, and it's now heavily focused on audio and podcasting. The reason for that is because I have been very privileged to have been listening to some wonderful stories for really for the better part of the last two decades. And there was no way to bring it to you guys other than through writing, which is a medium that's somewhat limiting. So I'm very happy that with the technology in hand, I'm able to let you listen in on conversations, which is what my podcasts are. It's just a conversation that is recorded of people that truly are worth getting to know. And Steve is certainly one of those people. As a matter of fact, we did record a podcast with him a few weeks back, and that is available if you're still craving more information after this um, live show um, there's a lot of fantastic stories um that steve shared so please check that out ilona can yeah. i interrupt real quick uh I'm, I'm, I'm gonna throw up a website so you guys can see i forgot to show this um if you look at the screen the first website i'm showing right now is um is reynolds family winery if you go there and you hit shop that's where you can look at all the great wines that they're selling uh ilona's pellet expo exposure right here is um this is her website. You'll see I, I clicked it straight where the um, the podcast is of Steve. Um, and then here's the uh, the Bottle of In website. And at the Bottle of In website, um, what we're going to do is actually, uh, sorry, let me click on this. If you go to the news and events right here, it's, it's our blog. We will end up uh, putting all this content in there. And I know, I know Ilona is going to do that as well as Reynolds. So I, I would look for our blogs to get any content. The other beauty about this, guys, is that... Um, you will uh, Facebook will keep this on there as a live stream, so you can you can watch the video and then you can pause it and and do any of the QR codes that you want to do. Um, so it won't it it's something that we will you, you'll get all the information that you can watch again. So back to you. Thank you. And now we get to talk to Steve, the hero of the hour, and Steve wears many hats. I don't know many vintners with 
dentist background. I think you might be the only one. Certainly, you're a fantastic winemaker, uh, great dad, great husband. I know you met the love of your life, your partner in crime in 1993. You guys made a very bold move in 1995 when you launched the brand. So tell us all about it. Well, can I start drinking? Uh, I thought you already have. I'm just no, well, you know, well, I kind of did before we went on air, but <laughs> I figure, you know, probably everybody at home has at least a glass of wine going on already. So I figure it's only fair that I get to wet my palate. So I will start with the first wine that we'll work into. But um, yeah, so actually, um, I'm very blessed. You're right. The uh, the anchor, the main main person in my life, Susie. Um, you know, I was very blessed. We got to know each other through her older brother many, many years ago and started dating and we've been together for, I'm going to say about 30 years now. Wow. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, without her, this winery would not exist. So very blessed. Here's to you, honey, of course. Um, so yeah, we had this crazy idea of coming to Napa and we thought we'd just be gentlemen farmers and I would stay a dentist and she'd possibly stay in the insurance world. And, uh, but you know, one thing led to another, we fell so in love with this property that, um, we decided to make it all the eggs in that one basket. So really long story short, um, what started as a vineyard then became a winery, then became both of our main source of income or livelihood. And, uh, this, that we're drinking right here, or Chardonnay, and I'll let you talk a little bit about that, um, was never going to be originally part of the program. We were going to be Cabernet Kings. Um, that's what we thought we would do. We didn't think we would be making whites. And, uh, but uh, my wife is a Chardonnay gal. And uh, so this um, was instantly added to the repertoire. So this is really an inspiration. And I know that you have unusual aging method, right? It's concrete which adds a whole other set of criteria and fabulous characters to the flavor profile, doesn't it? You know, it does, you know, along the way, I think like anything, you know, my background, you know, I'm not really necessarily formally trained, although I did go back to Davis, but kind of more of a school of hard knocks kind of guy and learned um, through a lot of local winemakers that taught me things along the way. And one thing I do know is you have to trust your palate. You have to trust what you like. And sometimes it takes a long time to figure out what that is because you got to go through a whole bunch of different experiments. So, you know, naturally, you know, you try barrel fermentations with whites and you read about that. You try traditional stainless steel tank fermentations. And then, of course, concrete, which is very, very old in the world of winemaking. But I'm going to say 10, 12 years ago, somebody made a white wine that became obviously very highly rated. So of course, what do you, what do you do? Um, you run out and make a wine that was produced in concrete. And, um, you know, obviously it's, we're all kind of that way. Somebody wins an award and does something really great with one style. So we all rush over to that direction. But for us, what I found is there were so many things that I liked. Each style had its own value, had some characters that I really loved and liked along the way. So our winemaking style, particularly for our whites, is a combination of fermenting in barrels, stainless steel, and in concrete. But one thing that is true for all of those is keeping it non-malolactic, which is a little crisper and brighter, not so buttery, um, the way to describe that. So this is my wife's favorite wine, dedicated to her, Susanna Reynolds. Um, so this is a concrete, barrel fermented, stainless steel fermented, surly worked, non-malolactic Chardonnay from the list of <laughs> Napa Valley. It's a mouthful. You now have to say it three times fast, those folks watching at home. Yeah, let me wow. try that after I get to the end of the run here and see how we do <laughs> well, Your Chardonnay is all that and more. It's, sometimes it reminds me of sunlight in the glass. It's just so uplifting. And it has such beautiful minerality and acidity. So it's the wine that makes me happy. So thank you, Suzanne, for making that happen for all of us that love that stuff. 
your history um, certainly is um, quite peppered with various events, both personal and on a larger scale that were quite challenging. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about all the obstacles that you had to overcome, not to bring the doom and gloom and discussion, but just to put in the proper context. Um, the obvious elephant in the room is that we're all going through worldwide crisis. And many of us um, are more affected than others. And I think overall, the probably the most teachable moment is that it's a litmus test for us as a nation, our way of life, our way of thinking, what are we really made of? Um, and how we come out of it at the end of the day, because that too, at some point will be managed, maybe not end, but will be in some sort of a contained scenario. Meanwhile, I really feel it's an opportunity for us as humans to shine. And you were presented with many iterations of such opportunities. And so this is not unique in that sense to you. And there was even a wine born of that, which we'll hopefully talk about next. But I just want you to tell us what's been happening since you started the brand. Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, we all start, for us, I'll just say, I, I, I'll admit my wife sometimes criticizes me or makes jokes about it. I shouldn't say criticizing me about being a dreamer. Um, there is no doubt I am a dreamer. Um, you know, there's just things along the way that seemed intriguing to me and just needed to be done. Um, maybe to satisfy your soul. I don't know what the inspiration is or what drives us along the way to, to take us down these crazy paths that we all go down. Um, you know, I just fell in love with the wine thing. I think it was around in my life since I was a teenager living in Europe. My dad was a huge wine collector and loved wine. Same with my mom. And that exposure to Europe and seeing that lifestyle, I think, just planted a seed many, many years ago that uh, just never grew until I got older and had the opportunity to come to Napa. And we got here, you know, you think it just seemed like, oh, this should be easy. It looks so easy from the outside. You know, it's so romantic, the vines and walking through the vines and, you know, opening a cork and pouring it into the bottle. But there's so much more to it. And I don't think you really, I think everybody has this in their life. Everybody has a job or things they do that people just, you just sometimes go, oh, God, I wish someone could get it, have any clue what this is all about. You know, for us, once we dove in and kind of invested and did this, this change of life, um, there was no going back. You know, we were vested. We'd put our money here. And uh, so we did. We planted our vineyard. We had some obstacles along the way, a lady next door that did not want a winery next to her. And she held us up for over two years, you know, in courts, trying to fight having a winery here, despite 600 neighbors saying yes, we had one opposing. Um, nonetheless, um, after two years, we finally got through it and we were able to prevail or persist as the wine has come become to know, be known. Uh -huh. um, we had many obstacles along the way, but, and I won't get into that tonight because uh, really kind of think tonight should be more about fun. And I probably, if there's clanking in the background, I should have probably told our cleaning crew that we we're doing a podcast right now. So if you hear something, there's hard work being done in the back. They're persisting cleaning while we're doing a, a, a oh, I love that. <laughs> anyway, um, but this wine's called Persistence. Hey, Steve. Uh, so the next wine that we're going to have here is hey, a Cabernet-based wine. So it's Cabernet Merlot, Cab Franc Syrah, and Petit Verdot. Ah. To me... The Syrah was the magic, right? To me, the Syrah was the, the thing nobody was doing back in 2001. It was not one of the noble grapes um, mm -hmm. from France, um, but Syrah was pretty hip. It was going to take over the Merlot space back in the day. And uh, that never quite happened. I know there was a movie that kind of made some of those decisions for all of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, for us, it made a brilliant wine. It had the complexity of the blending arts and, excuse me, um, but some of the, the lusciousness, the fruit that the Syrah has that we use seems to carry that fruit tone through the wine. So you get complexity of blending, like all the French great blends, but something more unique 
that we want it to be more Napa-ish. We wanted this to be distinctly sort of a California with a smile in the glass. So uh, this is uh, persistence that I get to drink. <laughs> yes, and um, one of the terms that leap to mind when I taste persistence is definitely sexy. So that luscious quality that Syrah brought to the party is definitely showing up in spades. What informs your blends every year as far as the percentages? Is this intuitive or what happens when you actually compose your final blend? You know, we started years ago, with, let's say the first couple years that we made the wine, we had these percentages and blends and certain vineyards that we were working with. So we always go back to that. When we put together the next year's blend, we always open four or five previous vintages next to it to see what what the basic character is. Mother Nature is always going to have their, her hand in each one of those, and we know that. But there's going to be something that uh, we're trying to keep that's, that's consistent. You know, when you open a bottle of wine and you're going buying something from a purveyor, I think there is something. You definitely want some consistency. You're okay with nuances, right, because that's part of the fun. Uh, we don't want this to be cookie cutter, but at the same time, we do not want you to be disappointed. So that's kind of our style. We opened the previous years. We have a basic formula, but then we tweak it. This year might need another percent of, of the Merlot or the fruit just isn't there or the spiciness needs a little more of this or the acidity. So what's nice is working with multiple vineyards and five different varietals we can usually find something that'll bring that consistency back home. And this wine has been in your portfolio for how long now? Uh, since 2001. Wow. You'll probably have a revolt in your hands if you ever decide <laughs> to skip a vintage because that wine is so darn delicious. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's funny you ask about blends and I was thinking about this today is how, how do you really describe that and how do you arrive at a flavor? and I was thinking a great analogy, sort of like if you're a coffee drinker or a tea drinker, um, you know, for you, whether you even say your coffee, whether you like your coffee black, there is sometimes how many coffee grinds you put in. There's a certain you like it this dark or you like it that light. Or when you're starting to add things to it, how much cream? Oh, they put a little too much. Oh, I, no, I just like one packet of natural sugar. Or, oh, I do like for everybody, there's that half a pack three quarter of a pack. I just like a half a tablespoon for your mouth, for your palate. There's that perfect cup of coffee. And every day I'm kind of trying to produce coffee in a bottle, if you will, that everybody's going to like, but that's impossible. So really you've got to do something that's going to satisfy you yourself and your palate. But also when you do open it for other people, you do see a lot of smiles and you kind of get the sense. Okay this seems to be something that you may like your coffee black, but hey, this is pretty good tonight. I would definitely drink this. This is such a crowd pleaser of a wine. If I were to identify one wine in your portfolio that I have a hard time thinking that everybody wouldn't like. It's just so incredibly friendly. It has the depth and the structure and we could talk ad nauseum about tasting notes, but the most salient piece to me is that it's, again, it makes you smile. It has those hedonic qualities. I agree, I agree. And by the way, tonight, hopefully it's Friday. You might have forgotten that because nobody really knows what day it is any longer, being home all these days. <laughs> oh, bless. Uh, Speaking of it, bless. It is like happy hour almost, or some places uh -huh. it's already happy hour. For us, it's always happy now, right? We're, we're all home. And you know, this news around us, it's so depressing. It's so scary for so many people that, you know, it's kind of cool to be able to do this, to be able to just get together and do these kinds of things. Hopefully everybody's reaching out, saying hi to their friends, their family, a little bit more. Um, my positive spin, just to change the subject for a minute about wine is, mm -hmm. through every tragedy, something good does come out. You know, for me right now, I'm getting to spend so much more time with my family. Um, we're making more meals together. I'm cleaning that closet that I've looked at for 15 years. Um, you know, those drawers, you know, when you move into a house, you ever notice like, you? okay, we'll just put that over there. You ever notice 20 years later that put that over there is still over there. You know, that junk drawer, 
right? So now is that time that you can open those bottles of booze and hit that junk drawer. That's how I look at it. I think this is an opportunity. I know it's terrible what's going on, but sometimes you just have to look at the half full, not the half empty. I highly agree. And my, my vision for today. No, it's awesome. And I'll just piggyback one thing. Please open your best wines. Uh, you know, that whole rainy day thing, it's rainy. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Hey, I'm going to jump on to number three. I don't want to yeah. drag this out there. Yeah. I, I want people to start walking over. I'm so yeah. excited about this because it's a very unsung bridal, right? Cabernet Franc. This is. It is such a cool story, you guys. First of all, just as a little background, I know there's some Cap Franc lovers out there, but do you guys know that it actually predates Cabernet Sauvignon? And Napa is known for Cap Sauv, so I was kind of surprised to find out that Cap Franc came before Cap Sauv. And of course, it relates to Merlot as well. It's a slightly earlier ripening variety, right? Um, and a little bit lighter. Uh, it's often used as a blending grape. Uh, so your classic Bordeaux blend is very likely to have it. Um, it's more subtle, which is why it's so much appreciated. It's a bit shy than Cap Sauv. It's a bit more muted, but that actually makes it so much more interesting. There's a lot of sophistication to that grape. It still has all the body and the tannins and the color. It's just not quite as pronounced. Um, one of my favorite wines of all time, actually, is Guadalatasso. And if you guys have had Italian wines or have them in your cellar or have heard of the producer, of all the wines that I've ever tasted consistently, that's the one that landed the best on me. And I'm talking super Tuscans, it's the Sakaya Analyze. I've always gravitated toward Guadalatasso very early on in my wine drinking career. And guess what? When I learned that it's Cab Franc, it floored me. So it can be quite powerful and it has, it takes on, it's kind of chameleonic, it takes on a lot of different iterations and different terroirs. So I am beyond thrilled that you made a Cap Franc, number one. Number two, it's the 2017, which we need to talk about immediately, if not sooner. So please tell us the inspiration and the whole story. Well, I think there's probably a label you can see. Um, there's, there's actually a slide that'll go through during the rotation. So 2017, as most, most of you know, was Napa's fires. And... Um, we were literally ground zero of the Atlas fire. We're right at the base of the hill. So within 20 to 30 minutes, that fire came down to the hill and burned most of our neighbors. So if you've been here, most of you've seen, you've driven, been up uh, Soda Canyon Road, almost every home next to us burned. So we were very blessed, very blessed to be sort of the fire break, if you will. We had our outer fence line burn, which is the photograph that's on the label. So I was sitting out after getting the family out, out of the property, off the property, I was sitting out on the road and then, you know, the sheriff and the, the last fire trucks came, they stopped and the sheriff got out and said, Hey, we're, we're out. We're, we're the last, we're the sweep. You need to leave. And I said, well, what is the law? And he said, well, is this your driveway? And I said, yeah, I said, well, I can't force you to leave, but you should leave. So I said, look, I'm going to just sit here. And when I see those buildings catch fire, I know which way you're going. I, I'm, I'm right here. I'll get out. But until and everything Susan and I and our family had our whole livelihood was sitting back at this winery in our house. So I, I just had to see it with my eyes. So anyway, I took that picture about that moment that's on the label of our neighbor's house burning and our fence on fire with our sign right there. So this wine is called Ember, which is, you know, obviously a play on the fires. And really what this was, was, um, smoke taint um big topic of conversation that i mean we could go on for hours and keep it very simple you know i get i know i get told sometimes i i go on and on and on but um what is smoke taint i think that to me again being a half full not half empty person so many people so many wine club members and people that i was at dinners with what does that taste like what is it exactly and i thought you know what why would we not try to put something out there, if, if nothing else, for a much lower price than our other wines or something fair. The fruit that is in this wine is very exceptional and expensive, but it did have smoke taint. So what happens is smoke obviously is in the air, but what type of smoke, what burned? 
That right there is one of the key elements. Is it just sagebrush? Is it palm? Is it oak? Is it pine? Is it a naga hide? Is it a Ford Escort? You know, what <laughs> is burning obviously is going to make a very big difference in your taint that's in your wine. So the smoke gets onto the grape. The grape is a waxy surface, so it sort of gets embedded there. And as the grape ferments, these molecules follow their way into flavor molecules through that process. So they're very hard to get rid of because of the waxiness. It's not something you can just, oh, just scrub the grapes. Um, doesn't work. Um, we've tried it, trust me. So here you've got you know, your whole year as a farmer, everything you've grown is out there and in one hour, in five minutes can be totally ruined possibly. Okay, so what we have in Ember are um, some vineyards that were picked after the fire that literally were right, again, right at the heart of where all the fires were, right in the deep of the smoke that we brought in. But one thing that we did do differently is we make a wine called the quote here at Reynolds that we were the first winery in the U.S. to do trials using ozone, ozone gas. Well, in a hotel room, if you check into a hotel room and there's been a party or something doesn't smell good, something's happened in that room, they will actually bring in a machine that is an ozonator and it will atomize the smoke or other molecules. Anything that has aromas kills pretty much anything. So the night of the fire, I was lucky enough that I knew some scientists back in Italy. So I hit them up real quick and said, hey, could you help me out? So they gave me a protocol to treat our grapes that we picked and put them into a container and ozonate them to try to, you know, neutralize and break apart the molecules. Um, one of the predominant one, here's your trivia for the day, you can take to your cocktail parties, is 4-methylguayacol is one of the dominant smoke molecules and one of the, one that, the ones that we measure and can be measured to check to see if a wine's going to be destroyed. This wine, Ember, actually does have levels of 4-methylguayacol, but it's a tricky molecule. It's one of these molecules that can kind of show itself, hide, show itself. The wine can taste great when you bottle it, but a year later, it totally shows itself and it's terrible. It can be smoky when you bottle it, and then a couple years later, it's great, it's gone. This is a wine that we had a, uh, we had a party. I invited um, a bunch of concierges, um, several other great winemakers from the Valley and um, Psalms, a bunch of people that were in the industry. And to get into the party, you had to taste two wines and you had wine one, which you had to taste A, B, and C, wine two, A, B, and C. You had to pick your favorite wine. And then you also had to pick the wine that was smoke tainted. That's all you did, you voted. Ironically, guess what wine won? It was the smoke wine on both of them that people enjoyed. <laughs> So here's my closure on that because I don't want this to go on too long. Um, our barrels are built over a flame. So we've been drinking wines that have had levels of smoke taint or smoke uh, manipulation, whatever that term is. In other words, we've come to like a version of that. Now, whether you like this or don't like this, at least you can learn something. And I think where I find the biggest difference on smoke tainted wines is the very, very finish of the wine. After you swallowed it, it's that little second and third swallow of what you taste. And sometimes it's just a little sort of dry mouth, ashy. You can just catch a little bit of that. But now if you live in Texas or you live in Oklahoma or the South, I'll go North Carolina South. Let's keep going there because I don't want to leave anybody out. If you like barbecue, I'm telling you, this could be one of the best wines you've ever had. I'm just saying right now. So anyway, Ember could be something fun for you to try at home. That's, that's about it. And the pedigree of the fruit is unbelievable, by the way. Mm. You know, I, I will say to comment on Cab Franc, a lot of people get asked, we winemakers get asked, hey, you know, what grape, if you were stuck on an island and you had to make only one wine, and almost everybody picks Pinot Noir pretty much, right? Because it's a finicky little thin skin grape and has so many variations thereof. 
for me, it would be Cabernet Franc because I think it's, uh, she's an elusive one. Um, it can be, it, it wears all kinds of hats. It can be very spicy. It can be very fruit forward. Um, to get it to have fruitiness and fruit components, it has to sit on the vine much longer, which makes it very tough. So to me, um, Cab Franc is one of those ones that I think is the most challenging, but also can be one of the most rewarding. I'm just trying to wipe an image of you as a superhero with an ozonator. <laughs> I'm totally distracted by that. <laughs> well, there you go, you guys. This is such a great opportunity. And really, please, don't just assume that 2017 that's been labeled by the press the fire year needs to be overlooked for that reason. There's so many wonderful stories like this one. And if you guys, um, you know, take the time and the trouble to do a little research or to listen to smart, wise folks like Steve, you will do yourself a huge favor, do your palate a favor, which is what I'm all about, is that treat your palate well. And this particular wine might just be a revelation for you. And uh, Alona, just to say, 80% of Napa's fruit was in before the fire. So all of our Reynolds releases that you will buy other than this are smoke free. And 17 was a fantastic vintage. So to let you know, you know, don't be afraid of them. Make sure, you know, fill your cellars because I think there's a great, there's some great ones out there. There'll be fewer of them, but this, we bottled very little of it, just enough mostly to cover our wine club. Um, we try every year to make something unique and different that we're not going to sell to the public. And to me, you know, I know you you can why you know you need to convey. I know you were thank you very much. You helped me on this stuff. Convey like why would people buy Reynolds wines? I think you know that's really it. I think you know. We still try to do things that other people are not doing. We try to handcraft them. We try to do, for me, what would I want? And to me, heck yes. Would I like, to, if I weren't a winemaker and didn't have to go through this, would I want to learn that? Would I want to sit at home and kind of read a little bit about this and understand it? Because it's going to come up in your life again. And let's face it, at the next, again, cocktail wine party, hmm, it's nice to be the smart guy every once in a while. So. Mm -hmm. To validate this further, for what it's worth to you folks, um, there's a really fantastic event in Napa Valley every February called Premier Napa Valley. It's a trade event, but it's a fantastic opportunity to preview the vintage, usually um, the two most recent vintages that are you know, about to be ready at port side by side, 16 and 17. 16 is a phenomenal vintage, but it's pretty shut down. I'm making sweeping generalizations, but I probably tasted couple hundred wines over a three to four day period. 17s we're giving with both hands. I have to say it's my favorite vintage of late and it's unthinkable for me to step away from it. So please do your own research, trust your own palate, forget what everybody else says, taste the wines. Exactly right. No, <laughs> I got off my soapbox. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, that you make special wines for your club, which is to me a pretty important reason to be your best friend and to participate. Uh, one of them, I believe, might be the one we're tasting next, right? The Steward of the Lion, is it, isn't it typically just for your club members? So it is. So, you know, we wanted to, um, you know, I'm very blessed that I get to work. You know, I know we've thanked my wife, thank my family, all my kids, everybody for all they do to support us. But our team at Reynolds is unbelievable and I'm very blessed, you know, our our cellar guys led by Arturo, um, our vineyard team, Israel, and everybody that works with them, just super blessed. And we have another property called, um, called Persistence, ironically, mm -hmm. um, 20 acres off of Monticello Road that's over on the border of Coombsville. And uh, we wanted to see what we could do with a couple of the little slightly hillside sections of changing some farming and just pushing the envelope a little bit through, you know, farming a little better organically, dropping more fruit, controlling a little more of the growth of the plant. And, uh, you know, a few years down the road, we started to see some good results. So the steward of the land, obviously the name kind of is exactly what I just described is, you know, 
I think, you know, being a steward of the land, you're, you're trying to do things to give back to the land because they get, you know, earth gives us so many wonderful things, including this great liquid fun that's in my glass right here. So, you know, for me, um, steward of the land seemed appropriate because that's what we do every day really here as far as our farming is concerned and it's a it's a cabernet franc mostly but cabernet franc and cabernet blend from that vineyard just certain sections we didn't make a ton of it um, this could possibly be a wine that we do add to our lineup because already the people that have tasted it have just you know we're, we're getting reorders quite a bit already so it's always a good way to test the market. But for me, you can see I love left bank, right bank. I mean, there's so many wines I've tried over my life, whether it be a Merlot blend, but that Cab Franc is so popular right now and I've become a total believer. So that's what this is for us is obviously we showed quite a bit of Cab Franc today. We wanted it to be a show that showed some of the wines that, you know, we have a whole lineup, but wanted to show a few things that are really unique to people too. And I love how you described it. It's exquisite. It has this elegance to it that is uncommon. A well-executed cap front, there's nothing like it. Oh, this is so, I mean, I, I didn't want this to become a, I wasn't going to sit here and tell you uh, tasting lavender and, you know, <laughs> no, that's really not what tonight's about, right? Well, you look so um, debonair. It would actually fit. Yeah. <laughs> I should have put my smoking jacket on. There you go. And, uh, I tell you what, I got to tell a quick story. Um, one of the funniest things I ever saw, Jamie Whetstone is a good friend, winemaker. Hopefully you guys have tried their wines. Mm. Jamie did the High Museum out in Atlanta one year. And when his auction came up, he made this little video. I was so jealous. I wanted so bad to have had this idea. He, the video opens with him in a smoking jacket, you know, leaning against the fireplace. Um, with a glass of wine and it's just hysterical i don't know if you can google it if it'll come up but you know he's sitting there swirling his glass and something to the effect of i'm jamie whetstone i'm a winemaker and just that you know almost that you know in your face and you know, jamie's a good looking surfer dude and and it ends with him like going out again leaning looking back saying something like you know from california drops his smoking jacket and gets into the hot tub and of course they fog out the the private parts but hysterical one of the funniest things so you know i figure as we get towards the end of this and uh you know humorous things like that i think that's what we're all about right now so google that see if that comes up i don't even know if it's if it's out there and get a hold of jamie if not i'm sure he'll send it to you hey i have an idea just popped into my mind i'm about to possibly give a bottle of your wine away steve how about everybody that's watching it write in about what they want to see you at. And the one that gets chosen gets a bottle of wine. Oh, what nice character thing. would you like to see, Steven? Oh boy, that's scary, that's scary. I know, you have no control over it. It's I'm all not, you guys. I'm not sure I like this. Might have to go to something bigger. I mean, I'm on wine, but I got one thing left, another bottle over here next to it that, you know, just so we move this along. All right. well, yes, yeah. <laughs> no, we, uh, we'll put a pin in it because, um, yeah, maybe after the tequila shot, we'll talk you into it. Because I know personally. Hold on, did you see what I did? Squirrel. Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You, you pulled the squirrel, but I'm not giving up because I think you would be a fantastic thing. But you last can, but not least. Huh? You can keep talking, but I'm going to go into this baby. I know. You just can't, you can't control yourself. You just, like, love handling this beautiful oh, model. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. The Penta. And for those that don't know what that means, why Penta? So I have started every wine dinner for over 20 years um, raising a glass of tequila. As a surprise, maybe not so much of a surprise anymore. I think the cat's out of the bag. Sometimes I'm not sure if people come to our wine dinners for the wine or they want to do a little tequila shot. Either way, it doesn't matter. As long as they get there, that's all that really matters. But for us, for Susie and I, you know, we like to honor the people that we've worked with for so many years. And, you know, for us, we noticed that, uh, you know, the true winemakers of California, as I call them, you know, a lot of our Hispanic population, my guys, we really never get the credit. They're never on these, you know, little live streams, very rarely. And, uh, 
you know, it's just my way or our way of giving back a little bit to make sure people knew that there are, you know, 99 hands that touch a bottle of wine and I'm only number 100 when I bring it to you. So one dinner at a time, it was my way of just saying thank you to them. So, you know, you come to one of our dinners and at the very beginning, we all raise a glass and let's face it, nah, dinner's a little more fun when you've had a little taste of tequila. I'll be honest with you. Everything's better with a little shot of tequila. So several years ago, I went down to Mexico and decided to learn more about it because everyone thought I was an expert. And candidly, I wasn't. I enjoyed it, but didn't know a lot about it. So I uh, fell in love with it and I'm very blessed. I've got four partners um, that have helped me make this what it is. So Penta means five. Mm -hmm. So in the country of Mexico, there are 32 states and five of those states can make tequila. We were the first guys to go down and grow agave in all of Mexico's five states um, and make the first layered complex tequila, but more of the vision of winemakers. So it has more refinement, um, you know, things like cutting more or almost all the skin off and kind of like look at it as a pineapple. You know, you wouldn't want the skin blended up into your smoothie. We used more of the sweet meat characters. Um, we cooked it slower like sous vide. We used purified well water. We were the first guys to use champagne yeast and do trials with that. So uh, anyway, if, uh, if you haven't tried it, um, we might even be doing one of these about Penta in the next week or two. Um, you can go to pentatequila.com, check it out. A little selfish little pent that thing out right there. But uh, this is uh, normally we start our little dinners or events with tequila. I figure, you know, we can kind of end it this way too, or we can talk through this, whatever you'd like to do. But anyway, uh -huh. yeah. Ilona, we're not ending, but I do want to thank you. <laughs> I want to thank Paul. I want to thank James. I want to thank everybody for who's tuned in tonight or who has supported us through this whole, I tell you what, it's, it's almost emotional for us because we have had so many people order wine. I'm almost choking up that. That's it. I'll just say thank you guys. No, you guys that are watching are really such an important part of this. You make people like Steve's, you know, professional lives possible because you are the ones right now, through your support, brands like his would flourish. And I don't want him to just survive. I want him to thrive. I've come to be a huge fan because it's one of the most honest minds that I've had from the Valley. Steve, as you've heard this entire show, is very much his own person. He's very respectful and obviously lives his life in gratitude, as you've heard, but he also has a point of view and he's not afraid of it. He's a first generation vintner and he's building a really important legacy. His slogan is drink American and what he's doing really is American dream. He's doing it his way. And I sincerely hope that you will support it. Cheers to that. Cheers, and thank you. I think I'm better now, I'm better now, so thank you. <laughs> I Thank decided to hop on. Oh, Should we wrap this thing up and let everybody go do their yeah. Friday night party? Yeah, I, I wanted to hop on because I did want to say one thing is, is that um, I, I Steve has been incredible to, to Yona's point. Um, I feel like family when I come at the Steve's Winery. And um, I, I can't, you know, I, I can't say enough about how Steve and, and please support them. They are incredible winery when we get out of this go visit the winery you've seen the pictures in the bottom right it's it's pretty incredible um again if you want to learn anything about the wine you know that it's on their site also in bottle and there's all all his tastings all his wines all the descriptions on it but i will say that stave is it is just incredible in his winery and and susie as well everyone the whole family is just incredible so thank you steve for letting me be a part of it thank you paul thanks for doing this all right. Cheers, everybody. Bye, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Have a great Friday. Indeed.